Hello and welcome to the Luchi and Mutton's podcast. I am Surabhi, your host, and I run Luchi and Mutton's Dog Behavior and Nutrition, a canine care practice that's based out of India. I work very closely with dog parents across the world to help them meet their dog's behavioral and nutritional needs in ways that are scientific, empathetic, and holistic. Welcome to episode number 19 of the podcast. We ended up taking a much uh, needed but unintentional break. And now we're back into the grind of recording and publishing episodes. So number 19 uh, on the podcast is a special, special conversation with Nikki French. She is a dog trainer based out of the UK and runs Pup Talks, which is an annual conference where she invites incredible speakers to talk about absolutely exciting and insightful topics uh, on dog behavior and everything related to dogs. She is also the author of the best-selling book called Stop Walking Your Dog. Um, it is a guide to training nervous, reactive, or overexcited pups. And she's done so fabulously with this conversation that in the UK now, there is a Don't Walk Your Dog Day, all thanks to her incredible efforts. So she and I sit down in this episode to talk about why walks may not be the right thing for different dogs and how can we support dogs who are having a hard time outdoors what can we offer them instead of these walks and what could transition back to those walks look like and when is the right time to do that it's an absolutely insightful rich episode and if you are struggling with your dog outdoors then this is definitely one that you must listen to i hope you enjoy this episode and walk away with lots of different learning have a great time listening in and I will see you soon. Hello, Nikki, and welcome to the Luchi and Muttons podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. Oh, I'm, I'm tough to bits to be here. Always lovely talking to you. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'm so excited because this is um, a topic that I feel really passionately about. Um, and I think that it was so interesting that when we connected um for pup talk um you know i think we briefly talked about it and it was just i think for me like you were one of the first people outside of a very small community who was talking about how walks are not right for every dog and i was just so amazed and inspired and i was like oh my god nikki is amazing uh, and so I think it's just so lovely to have you here and just, you know, really deep dive into that conversation. Amazing. It, it, it has become my favorite topic. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Roll on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I want to I wanna start by asking you, like, how did you arrive at that insight? Uh, and did that come from your own experience with, with your dogs or how, what was the origins of this idea? You. Yeah, so 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 I mean, not walking dogs either, either walking them less or stopping for a period of time. You know, it, it, I didn't invent it. Of course, I didn't invent it. Nothing is new. Um, but I think it really struck me as something that was incredibly powerful through a number of channels. One was my my own dog to some extent. But to a much greater extent, it was with the clients that I was working with. And it was during lockdown, like a lot of people, I had to take my business online. Um, and I was working with clients. I had a much broader range of clients because I was working with people online. I was no longer restricted to, you know, five mile radius or so. I have many dogs within a five mile radius of where I live. Um, so it really broadened the, the the kind of people that I was working with and the kind of struggles that they came to me with. And I don't know if it was a bit of a coincidence, probably not, that there was a number of people that I was working with, um, with quite high energy breeds, collies and working labs. Um, and walks were such a struggle for them such a struggle to the point that I, I would always ask people what sort of percentage of your walks you know in terms of a walk having something that happened that was maybe challenging for your dog or, or for you or for both of you what percentage of walks would you say there's something happens and people were saying you know all of them <laughs> and in my head I'm thinking if if half of them 
yeah. there is a struggle, then it's not the right thing to be doing. And, you know, it was it was a number of clients that were saying to me pretty much every walk, something at least was was going on that was was hard work for the dog. Um, and it was the second person that I said, you need to stop walking your dog that really kind of crystallized a the book as something that I needed to get out there but it was just it was just it it, it was the clients that were, were coming to me that kind of inspired me to think more people need to talk about this and to know that it's socially acceptable um and then there was my own experiences with my own dog you know he came to me as a, a young rescue dog he was eight months old um, he'd been in and out of the shelter system twice, um, you know, in the space of weeks, which as a, a young yeah. dog must have been so hard for him, so hard. And he just had so much energy and so much exuberance. He didn't know what to do with it. He didn't know how to switch off. And like a good dog mum, I was thinking, well, let's just do more with him. <laughs> let's yeah. help him through that by uh, making sure all his needs are met. And 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 very quickly, um, I think I, I think I came about the the solution because I was finding walks so stressful. So I had a very personal experience yeah. of, oh gosh, it's my turn to walk the dog. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of dread. Yeah. Uh, my gosh, you know, it's it's just going to be hard. And, and he wasn't um, reactive in terms of you know being worried by other dogs, but he was very physical like I, I couldn't let him off lead just to run and do whatever he wanted like it, it would have been yeah. chaos so so it was my own personal experiences of, of, of feeling that that dread of like uh oh <laughs> it's time to take the dog for a walk um and so I walked we started walking him less mm -hmm. and it was very apparent just in my own household how much easier he was later on in the day and in the evenings if we'd only had one walk in the day instead mm -hmm. of two or at streams, extremes three. So, so long answer is it was um, lots of inspiration coming to me yeah. from other people with their dogs and my own experiences. And I realized the power yeah. of reducing that part of what is a very traditional view yeah. of you, dog, you have a dog, you, you, you walk it for two to yeah. three times a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and again, I think that I had, a, I had a study, you know, to make notes of everything that you're saying, because there are so many different points that really resonate with me as well. And I think I, I want to start by talking about what you said, the traditional view on walks, right? And this idea that if you have a dog, especially if you have a certain kind of breed, then of course they need to be walked, not just two, three times, but perhaps they need to be out and about for like two, three hours at a stretch. Um, and you talked about, how I think through the conversations with your clients, but also through your own journey, you sort of, you're, you're taking something that is not socially acceptable and you're building buy-in for that and showing that for your specific dog, maybe this is what is required. Um, was that difficult? Was that pushed I, back? I think there's different levels mm. of, where it's acceptable, where it's a relief, where mm. so I'll, I'll tackle it at a number of different layers. I may I tend to lose my my thread, so do <laughs> bring me back to the question if I need it. Um, I think the people that were coming to me yeah. were so ready to hear something different, yeah. like they were so open to it, and there was it's it's I've brought, got goosebumps right now, like the relief yeah. that I got from people of going, thank you. Thank you for giving me permission. The amount of people have used that yeah. phrase. You gave me permission not to take my dog out. My my gut was telling me what I was doing wasn't right, wasn't working, but it felt so socially unacceptable. And I, 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 I gave them permission. Of course I didn't, mm. but it, it helped them give them, yeah. it gave validation yeah, yeah. to what yeah. their gut was telling them. So I think there that was very much I wasn't even pushing it an open door like they were just ready to just charge through it <laughs> um, back home with their dog. Yeah. Um, so I think there's that side of things. There is then the very interesting sort of ring around that of people's partners, children, immediate family 
friends and there's still very definite resistance beyond yeah. that so it's then um how people that are, are, are going down this route um the community that I'm creating mm -hmm. of people that are sharing their experiences of how how they've managed to get their sort of next tier on board and that has been you know easier for some than yeah. for others um and then I think there's the public perception. Yeah. I, th I think I'm, I'm very lucky to have a very, um, very well-educated uh, mm -hmm. group of dog guardians that are in my world. Um, and then obviously you've got other people that have dogs, but perhaps aren't dog people, yeah. let's say. Um, and, you know, when I, when I put stuff out into um, newspapers and in, in wider spaces then I can see a real pushback of like well that's cruel that's not yeah. right just you know sort of the more um traditional perhaps slightly more older fashioned views of yeah. just push on through push on through yeah. exercise them more so I think there's lots of lots of different layers but the yeah. most of the people that I deal with I think they are just so uh, so desperate for help and it it connects with them yeah. instantly when that you know when you start talking about it yeah. um yeah 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 I think I think permission is is such an accurate word to describe it um because again I think even even with the with the dog parents that I work with often this comes up especially in 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 contexts where the dog's really fearful really anxious or extremely reactive those are the those are the contexts in which for me this has often come up and they're having a hard time. They are really struggling. But because they've been told to power through, because they've been told that this is something that they have to be able to accomplish, they continue at it. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that it works at multiple levels, right? One is, of course, the walk just feels extremely overwhelming. I think very similar to you, it creates a creates this incredible sense of dread. It's not something that you look forward to. Um, you're worried about falling. You're worried about accidents. You you know, you're worried about just how you and your dog are going to engage in that environment. But I've also found that when those experiences add up, it also causes a lot of disconnection or I would say a severing of connection with your dog as well. Um, you know, you start seeing your dog as just a dog who's being really difficult to manage. Um, and I think that I think that when very I think exactly to what you said, when there's when they come to you, they're so desperate for someone to just, I think, see that and acknowledge that for them, that when you offer them that option, they're just ready to take it. There's very less pushback, really. I think I think there's more. The conversation is more about yes, you can do this. Of course, you can do this, um, and I think that's that's both sad, but also, you know, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. It's 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 really difficult. And I think I think that there's just so many emotions that are, are tied in with it. Of that, you know, there's the guilt yeah. that they're experiencing by struggling on the walk. There's the guilt that they don't know how to help their dog there is the embarrassment that they can be experiencing you know they'll be seeing people on the walks or their neighbors or whatever and and you know they can feel embarrassed by the way that their dog is behaving um there's often judgment from yeah. the people around them of the well you've got an aggressive dog or you should be doing this with your dog and all this well-meaning often advice that people can get um so yeah, that sort of that that embarrassment and that judgment that people can feel, I think, is is just it takes its toll. Like it's so hard for people. Mm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And and in your experience, Nikki, like, what what are some of the reasons that dogs would let's say struggle in the outdoor environment, especially when they're on walks? Like, what have you experienced as some of those reasons? Yeah. Um, so it can be concerns about other dogs so whether that is um you know 
often, you know, it can be tied in with frustration. You know, most of the time our dogs need to be on leads in a lot of the spaces that we take them to. So, you know, we know dogs can struggle much more on lead when they're not able to move freely and communicate freely. Um, some dogs are generally uh, worried. And yeah. obviously, I think through lockdown with the lack of great socialization uh, the the lack of exposure. I think a lot of dogs didn't grow up with the opportunity to develop as many skills as dogs might have done, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, so, you know, issues with dog communication, um, general lack of confidence. So whether that is towards other dogs, whether that is towards people, strange people you know people with glasses on people with hats beards like that novel aspect of some things um it could be a, a real noise sensitivity so i've worked with some people that um you know it, it, it they might be in a an urban environment and the roads themselves just caught is just too overwhelming so buses and trucks go by and they just sort of shut down and they'll pancake to the floor or it could be they live in lovely rural locations and it might be the occasional bird scarer yeah. that they can hear and that can be enough that their dog is just they're done like instantly and I've worked with some people like that 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 would be enough for their dog to just go that's it I can't do anything and they'll just shut down and they've had to ring partners up and say we're stuck here can you come and get us yeah um so um but also with the case of my dog like extreme over excitement <laughs> you know just like there's a dog there's a dog, mum. There's a dog, mum. Oh, look, there's a person. Oh, yeah. look, there. <laughs> literally, that's what our walks look like. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's all these things, and, yeah. and you know, even that, like, he wasn't learning anything. Yeah, in that environment, like, he's yeah. just so like, oh my god, I can see everything, and I need to interact with everything. Like, he had no off switch. Um, so it doesn't even have to be what we would deem as you know, uh, aggress aggressive looking right. behaviors or really scared looking behaviors. It can just be that they just find the world too much yeah. um, for whatever reasons. Um, those are probably the majority of, of, of what I what I see. Um, there are probably others, but they've escaped my mind for the moment. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And I think in, in when you were talking about, you know, your own experience with your dogs, you talked about how reducing how much you were out um, also made things easier and so can you talk a little bit about like what became easy as well yeah so at, at, at home in the evenings he would be a really big action prompting dog so particularly with my my boyfriend um he would it would start off quite cute like he'd just go and sort of put his chin on ash's leg and if yeah. that didn't get anything, he would very quickly es escalate to a yip that mm -hmm. drives, it is my boyfriend's most hated noise in the world. I'm <laughs> relatively relaxed about it, but I would very quickly escalate Ash's, Ash's levels of tolerance for that. Um, you know, he would be mouthing, like he would be grabbing wrists and arms and sleeves to try and get some interaction. You, you'd maybe have a little game with him and we'd try yeah. to do some training yeah. games. But like he just, if you weren't managing it in some way, he would be trying to goad you into some levels interaction like he couldn't sleep so he wasn't getting enough sleep because he just couldn't settle and rest so it was about trying to change that cycle of constantly switched on constantly vigilant constantly let's yeah. do let's do let's do yeah. and slowly taking him in the direction of we don't always have to be doing sometimes we can do nothing so yeah 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 I think it's interesting that you 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 talked about it becoming easier right because I think there's and I don't know whether it's I think it's true for everybody in general but I I, I think that I probably see it a little little bit more in the Indian context which is that we're just wired to want to do hard things you know we don't feel successful if we've not overcome the hard stuff or if we've not really like pushed through something that felt impossible and challenging, you know? Um, and, and so if there is an easy option, we're unlikely to take it because it feels like a cop-out. Um, 
the idea is always if you fa- if you're facing a problem if you're facing something that's really hard you work through it you push through it and then you arrive at the result if you take the easy way out then the result isn't as meaningful um is that something that you that you've experienced with this <laughs> I think if I see an easy way, I'm like, yes. <laughs> Maybe that is a difference in cultures. I don't know. Um, I think in some respects I'm like that. But when it comes to when it comes to stuff to do with my dog, I'm I'm to think I'm just grateful for there being a simple route. Whether yeah. that's just me, I don't know. But I think I see that in my same in the clients. But I think it is that that shift, that mind shift of do less to do more yeah. or do do less to 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 move further forward i think yeah. that that is a a shift to 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 make but i think what i see is how quickly people can have wins mm. even if they are skeptical and even if they're thinking well this doesn't feel hard enough like they, 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 yeah. <laughs> this should feel hard enough or else it's yeah, not going to yeah, work yeah. very quickly they can see yeah. some quick wins and and especially if people have gone to thinking well there's no way i couldn't walk my dog at mm. all and for some people it might just be shortening up the walk doing yep. some activities first slightly yep. shorter walk or picking a slightly quieter space and then a few games afterwards like it doesn't have to be a, an all or nothing situation yeah um but as soon as they start start to make that change in that direction the the, the winds just come I, I can't think of an example where people haven't come back to me and said uh yeah, I can't think of where somebody said, "Oh, well, I've tried these things and it didn't work." Like it's, it's just not worse. I, I, it's just not happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I yeah. think that that helps to um, validate that you know yeah. what people are doing is is the right route um, yeah. to go, and that inspires them to to keep keep Added, progressing. Yeah. Not to say it's easy, like it's not easy. You know, some some dogs are, are really challenging to to change things for. But as long as you can see something that is growing in the right direction, I yeah. think that that spurs people on to to believe the process. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think the I think the wins are important, and I think I think in a lot of these cases the wins come fairly quickly and easily. Like it's not you know it doesn't take too much to to feel that. And I think in some of the cases, like I've had skepticism where clients have felt, oh, I don't think my dog's going to be comfortable with this. I think my dog's going to have an issue with not wanting to step out. And when their dogs are very happy <laughs> to be home, when their dogs are very happy to be just chilling on the couch or on the bed uh, and show no inclination whatsoever to really want to go out, I think it's also very eye-opening to them. Uh, and I think that allows us then to have a much deeper conversation about what is it that your dog wants and what is working for your dog versus what you think is working for your dog. Um, and so I think that's also a really interesting insight that comes through those conversations. Yeah. And some dogs need encouragement to to do that, but some Absolutely. dogs do like, just embrace it completely. And I think also there's the that power of the positive cycle, you know, because if you have a dog that struggles on walks, that's a really tiring emotionally draining place to be and to break that cycle and to start that going in the in a in the right direction so if you've got a dog that is stressed their home you know their stress hormones are through yeah. the roof the human stress hormones are through the yeah. roof they can both sense and smell each other's stress hormones and you know you've got that that negative cycle whereas by reducing or shortening or stopping walks you 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 give both of their nervous systems a rest yeah and then the human is probably in a much better state when they do do something with their dog whether that's outside the house or not and and therefore the, and the dog is slightly more relaxed because they haven't just had multiple days of getting completely you know overwhelmed with things and 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 then that that positive cycle starts yeah. you know yeah. and and so so that in itself i think is is also yeah. um yeah a massive so. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm so glad that you brought up the negative cycle for both humans and dogs, because again, I think some of the old school advice on, I think, especially walking dogs who, who are reactive, right? Uh, I think the onus to stay calm is a lot on the human who's walking them, right? So, you know, a lot of the old school advice has been in the in the territory of, 
it's okay if your dog's having reactions to different triggers, but you stay calm, right? <laughs> and it's so hard to stay calm <laughs> in the face of a storm. Um, and I think that, you know, and, and I think we don't, I think one is obviously this really obvious, loud response to the environment. But I think what we fail to sometimes recognize is as tension builds up in our body, we also we also exude that energy in little ways, right? It's something as simple as tightening of the leash. It's something as simple as, uh, you know, the pace of your walk picking up. It's something as simple as stiffness in your body. It's something as simple as impatience coming in. Like there are so many different ways that that tension builds up. And I feel like it's so unfair to put this burden on the human to be calm when their dog's having a hard time. And I think that when we share these kind of, for most of us, when we share these kind of really intimate relationships where there is care and there is love and there is connection with another being, watching someone have a hard time is us also having a hard time, right? And the only thing to do in that moment is just get everybody out of there and stop it, as opposed to putting on this, Putting this, like, I think walking with this pressure of you having to be the one to hold it all together and then not being able to do that and creating those cycles of guilt and shame and, you know, self-judgment. And um, I think that's also really painful. And I find that there's a lot of that unpacking that also has to happen around these conversations as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you you know, you're right. It's like you, you absolutely can stop, take a breath, drop your shoulders, loosen the lead. But largely, you're sort of faking it to yourself. And if you're faking it to yourself, your, your dog's not buying it. I, I don't believe. <laughs> if, 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 it, if, if it's faking it to yourself, and then it's it's becoming the reality. Yeah. But you you can't. And as you say, if you know, most of the people that that have dogs like this would do anything for their dog. And it's it's distressing. It's yeah. distressing. And, you, and how how can you feel anything other than? distress when your your dog is having a hard time yeah 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 and and do you find that in your you know in, in in the way that you've supported your clients like asking them to stop the walks or reduce the walks has that been like a permanent solution or has it been an interim solution as you you know helped the dog decompress and find regulation as well yeah, I think um, there's one lady that I've been working with. Uh, she's probably at the, I don't know that anyone has stopped walking permanently yet. Mm -hmm. So um, this wonderful client, Gabby, she stopped walking her dog for nine months completely. Um, that's the longest. But then she has started to build in other activities. Yeah. And, and now they, they do go to, you know, dog fields and, and they're able to go away and do do other things, go on holiday and things like that. that previously un, un, unthinkable things. So that's probably I don't know of anybody that has not gone back to building in some activities out and about. Um, and, and for some, it is, you know, days, weeks, yeah. a couple of months or so. Um, and then for others, it's it's about just that reduction, like, you know, mm -hmm. just making it one walk a day or it yeah. may, might be two or three walks a week. Yeah. Or it might be six walks a week and then they have a duvet day where yeah. there's a day where they don't. And it is it's very much what is right for the dog and, and right for the humans in that household. Yeah. Um, I think the key thing is how if you do – feel the need and it feels appropriate to stop walks completely obviously you're doing other things instead but it's then how do you make the transition back exactly. into taking yeah. steps whether that's literal steps or via car journeys and other things yeah. um how you start to build things up in a positive way I think that's the thing that's um quite unique for each dog um, yeah that's actually what I'm trying to put into a second book now. So that's quite an interesting um, mm -hmm. development as to how I can, because it's what I'm doing with people one to one, and I want to try and people give, I try and give some people some insights into. Okay, so you've stopped walking your dog and you've started doing other things. Then what? Like, yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. then what's the next piece yeah. of the puzzle? So that's what I'm trying to sort of set out for people in some ways at the moment. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, I think I think stopping the walk but doing other things is so critical to that learning journey and again I've seen this is where I think 
you know like in general i find that for a lot of these new ideas where you know we're sort of flipping traditional things over the head right um i think these ideas get picked up quite fast but often with without the nuance or depth of it right and so i think i've also been part of spaces where i've had professionals recommend and some of them have been clients who've come to me after a round of conversations where the professional has recommended stop the walk but there is nothing in place of that and so what we've now done is we've stopped the walk which is great but we're also not creating opportunities for building new pathways in the brain we're not creating new opportunities for learning we're not creating opportunities to actually meet the dog's needs mm-hmm. and that creates a whole different set of issues as well um and so can you talk a little bit about the importance of taking something away but also adding something that actually does help the dog in that moment. yeah yeah absolutely yeah i mean it, it, it's essential this is not just stop walk stop stop walking your dog and, and watch tv instead absolutely not yeah. um yeah. and and i think that is a message that people can misconstrue so it is a really important one um it it's it's i think it's a, that balance of helping them to develop some of the skills that perhaps they're lacking mm-hmm. um so you can start to build some of those activities at home and or at suitable places if your dog travels well in the car yeah. um so it's building up those skills and then it's also giving them appropriate mental and physical stimulation and enrichment at, at home so that they ha- have the right levels of interaction with us um and and also just interactions with the world um and it's where was i going with that sorry forgive my forgive my 50 something year old brain (laughs) i told you i'd lose my thread at some point it always happens i just live with it now i could i could see your brain was working at supersonic speed oh no i don't know i I would say the opposite (laughs) Yeah, we're talking about the importance of creating of learning things. opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's exactly that. It is. Is it is just to. It, you can't just not expose them to those things yeah. and then hope that everything will be wonderful. I mean, obviously, if you live on a a massive farm or a homestead or estate where your dog doesn't need to go out and what you know, yes, they could yeah. probably just live perfectly happily without going out and about. But most of us don't live in those kind of environments. So, um, we you know, it would be lovely for our dogs to be able to experience different aspects of that world so you know they absolutely need some yeah um you know with with training with activities just to help them build up skills so that they can reintegrate in some way into the the normal world yeah. as, as we would see it and and it could be things like you know your your incredible sensory garden you know spaces like that people can set up things like that in their own home yeah. and yeah. and it might seem completely unrelated to get your dog having wonderful sensory experiences in their garden but if you can get dogs very comfortable with you know go sniff cues just going to explore certain things then if you are able to drive somewhere lovely and quiet to the quiet time of day then you can get your dog out and you can get them straight into similar patterns of behavior wow. so so those you can use those as sort of transition activities um you know i would use things like a noise box so a box where we scatter some food and it's got a few little things in there and they're happy to have a, f- a fun rummage and a fun snuffle around and taking that with you as a known object and literally having it out of the car somewhere yeah. super quiet that's outside the home. Um, and then you can get your dog out of the car on need if you need to. Yeah. And they're straight into, oh, I know this thing. Like, yeah. this is good. I love this. You know, I associate this with something fun. And um, so, yeah, there's there's absolutely the importance of, of, of doing things at home because you just don't want them to be just stuck unless you live on a farm in which case you're probably all good (laughs) yeah Yeah, absolutely absolutely like I remember with with uh, Mutton who was my uh, reactive pit bull I mean I just had such a horrendous time walking her the first few months that 
she had come to me and i had reached a point where i was just like i don't want to do this anymore at all and so we stopped walks i think for about and again walks i mean wasn't we didn't stop going out but we just stopped walks for about 3 months and i spent a lot of time doing enrichment for her inside the house mm-hmm. and what i would also do is i would actually go out collect twigs leaves branches and bring that back inside mm-hmm. give her a little bit of the outside world experience and then very very late at night we'd walk into a park that was right across our house uh and that's also where we started building off leash communication and skills and i realized that that was much easier to do in an environment that was quieter that was safer um where she was not constantly on edge all the time um and i think that was that was game changing for so many different reasons and and we did that for close to about i think 18 months we spent a lot of time just figuring out what were the right environments for not just her but also for me for me to show up in a way that uh was regulated for me to show up in a way where i wasn't panicking and freaking out and being impatient um and i think that what was really and i think for the longest time i think i i resolved to myself that this was how it was going to be i don't think i ever thought that we could go back to you know quote unquote normal roads with busting traffic and stuff like that but i think once we started doing that again i was really surprised with how beautifully she adjusted in those situations mm-hmm. um and i think i think it's something that you said there which is it is all related that decompression the opportunity to learn different skills in different ways is all related because i don't think behavior is necessarily an input output process right a lot of things happen all together and so i think that the merit in helping a dog just completely decompress relax uh and then learn in spaces that feel safe in spaces that feel you know without stress is is very very powerful and i think that that for me really builds that enduring ability mm-hmm. um, to say that you know it's it's not just something i'm teaching for the sake of it or it's not just a quick fix i'm trying to build this ability to regulate for the long term which i think is also really powerful I think yeah it I think that's a, a a really beautiful way of talking about like that creating that processing space like yeah. go uh, creating environments and situations where the dog is able to take in some of those things but in a way that they can manage and giving them time to process you know we yeah. can't shelter them from all of these things that yeah. cause them you know raised levels of anxiety we we can't shield them from everything but if we can create setups whereby we can take them to spaces in certain ways and give them time where they are able to be aware of the smell of other dogs or perhaps yeah. the sound of other dogs or the sound of you know you know distant noises or whatever um and for them to go okay i noticed it Mm. but it was okay and that that processing time you know if they feel relaxed enough to be able to process it rather than just instantly react and and i was thinking about um you know the the sort of the the dog picnic kind of thing of just like if we were going out on a walk with bodie we we pick one of his long lasting chews Bo- bodie needs to chew he's one of these dogs that needs to chew it's part of his decompression stuff yeah. um so we we pick him uh, we maybe take two or three chews with him um and then we would find somewhere very quiet to go and sit on a bench on a blanket or whatever and we'd get the chews out he gets to choose which chew he wants like i don't know in that situation is he going to yeah. want something you know really hard like a muscle or is he going to want something really light and quick and easy to eat like a little rabbit's ear yeah um so giving him that agency to be able to say this is what i'm ready for in this space yeah. um <clears throat> and and to be able to find out well you know is he even able to select mm. a chew and mm. eat You know that that in itself massive information so that's yeah. wonderful it may well be that 
you know, if your dog travels well in a car, that you go somewhere quiet in the car. And yeah. you just sit, you don't even get out of the car. It could be that you sit in the car with the air con running, all yeah. the windows open. Yeah. And again, you you know, they, they, they you might hand feed them a few treats or give them a lick mat or something like that or a chew. And you just take in the world in a little way. So there is there is really nice baby steps that you can take yeah. to be able to find ways to give them some exposure, but in a way that is very relaxed, very neutral. Yeah. And if you know your dog and you know what they really do enjoy doing, taking that with you and then there's great information of like, okay, how are they feeling in that situation? Yeah. And then you can you can build from there. So yeah, that processing space is, is yeah. massive because you, you can't shield them from everything ever, yeah. and you don't want them. You know, you want them to be able to experience the world yeah, and go. Oh, absolutely, hey, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. absolutely, absolutely. And I think what you what you talked about baby steps, and I'm, I'm guessing that that's true even for um, this idea of transitioning back to walks, right? Which is you take baby steps. You pause, you see, you check in with your dog, you take into account. It's almost like this dance, right, that you're doing with your dog mm -hmm. when you're taking feedback, you're going a few steps forward, a few steps back, you're adjusting. Um, I also think that a lot of people perceive that process to be slow and they'd want to get there faster. Um, and so the way that I have, I think, the way that I have found it help to, helpful to reframe that is one, I think, again, that whole idea of wanting to build like an enduring ability, right? And this is really for life. And we're trying to, you know, we're not trying to just fix something overnight. We're not trying to put a band-aid solution to this. We're actually trying to get our dogs to be able to think, process, take decisions accordingly. And then, you know, give us feedback about what's working for them and, not working, and what's not working for them. I think there's one aspect of that. But I also think the second aspect that I talk a lot about is it is it can feel slow. But I think that there is just so much beauty and learning in that process because you are discovering so much about your dog. And you're learning how to communicate. You're learning how to meet your dog's needs. You're learning how to read your dog. You're building trust. You're building attunement. Uh, there is just something so powerful in, in taking that one baby step, looking at what feedback your dog is giving you, and deciding whether you want to move forward or you want to take a step back. And then when you act on it, I feel like that builds so much trust between your dog and you. And a lot of that trust, you know, potentially has gotten a little eroded in the past in these difficult situations. And I think trust building is a slow process, right? It takes time, it takes patience. And so I, I have found that it's really helpful to manage that expectation by calling it a trust building process, really. Um, have you found that to be true as well? Yeah, I love that. And I, th I think what's also really helpful to for people to think about those baby steps is, I, it, again, as I said, it's absolutely you go slow to go fast. Yeah, absolutely do. And, and, and if you can grow those foundations, however painfully, slowly they feel like they are coming, like they it just pays back tenfold. It really does. And as you say, once you have that trust in each other. Like trust both goes both ways. Yeah. And once you have that, like, yeah. you know, yeah. you you can build on things. And and I and, and I think like what I talk to people about is is thinking about what a walk actually is. And it can be, you know, you can play a game with your dog in the kitchen or in the living room. And then as soon as you go towards the front door, everything goes pear-shaped again. Or when you get on your dog walking shoes, everything goes pear-shaped again. Or when you get the harness out, everything goes pear-shaped. So thinking about the walk as having all of those steps included 
Yeah. And actually, it's nothing about where you go once you go out of your home. Yeah. It is all those steps. So having those fun activities that your dog loves yeah. or the food that your dog loves or the toy that your dog loves, can they do those little check-in things yeah. all along the way? So by the time, say you haven't been walking them, you may well not have been putting their harness on for a while. Are you able to even pick up the harness yeah. before they start? mouthing at your wrist which can, yeah. can absolutely happen um and so breaking down all the, and and so in in terms of like you know those baby steps I mean they're they're microscopic baby steps yeah. for some people and, yeah. and, and I have done you know weeks of sessions with people where we've not even got the front door open like literally with the games that we were playing successfully elsewhere in the house yeah as soon as we took them into the hallway and the dog had the harness on like it it's out. like yeah. it's like they knew nothing yeah. um and, and and therefore then you have to say well if they are and I think that's a really good indicator for people to realize where their dog is at yeah. and to be able to get that feedback and to be able to grow that trust is if they are already bouncing up and down yeah then what is the walk going to be like when you get out it's probably yeah. going to be how it was before yeah so you have to be able to sort of break it back down and it may be then you're playing games with the door open or you yeah. go out at the front door you're literally over the threshold you're doing a little game and you come back in again and yeah. that is your walk yeah yeah and that is quite a shift for people to think but um yeah I, th I think it's a really essential step but if if people set things up in the right way yeah. once you are out actually the growth of how a walk can look the rest of it then happens so much more quickly because your foundations are massive absolutely absolutely and and is that what your second book is all about uh bits of that yeah yeah <laughs> but the the, the interest that I'm struggling with it at the moment I'm, I'm about 10,000 uh, words in um and from the the clients that I'm working with one-to-one -one, there's no one size fits all yeah so I'm trying to give examples of things as to how they can work so that right. people can identify and right. try different things so I, I want to kind of create an experience of working with me one-to-one -one, right. but being able to do that in a book to an extent <laughs> as much as I'm able to yeah. so it's, yeah, it's quite an interesting challenge but yeah it's mm -hmm. that kind of thing how do you go back to that mm. yeah very cool very cool yeah and and so if we do have people listening in who are struggling walking their dogs outdoors right now what are some things that you would want to let them know tell them that they can keep in mind and start putting into action right away yeah so I think on de depending on you know how significant the reactions are how how much they're struggling on walks to think about yeah, maybe just play around with mm -hmm. ditching a walk one day or maybe just walking them once and doing some activities at home. And, and you know, there's loads of res free resources online yeah. um, in terms of other things that you can do with your dog at home, whether it's games, whether it's scent work. There's, there's so many, so many easy things. So I, th I would say to people, just have a play about, maybe just drop one walk, yeah. maybe just take, ha take, have a duvet day, have a day where you don't walk and you do other things instead. And I think the beauty of it is it, is, is it can it, 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 I would say often. No, I think always. I would say it doesn't take more time than the time you would spend walking yes. your dog. <laughs> yes. You know, if if you're taking your dog for an hour's walk, you are not going to be doing an hour's scent work yeah. and training yeah. games at home. Like yeah. your dog will, your your dog will go to bed after half an hour. Like yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll be yeah. done. Absolutely. This is not about time. Um, it's about having a little bit of knowledge and doing a little bit of research of some things that are fun for you and fun for your dog and just getting stuck in and trying it and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that, you know, I, I think about something that we started with, I think, which is also to give yourself permission, I think, to just skip the walk, right? Especially mm -hmm. on days when, and I found this to be really helpful in my case where, I had days when I was just really exhausted. I was really tired. I was coming out of a depressive episode. I didn't want to step out. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be at home. And I think that releasing that pressure to say, oh my God, this is a chore that I have to check off and I have to do it 
versus really seeing it for re- really seeing it as an opportunity to just spend time with my dogs and connect mm-hmm. with them and i can do that anywhere i don't have to do that outdoors i can do that at home um and i think just holding that grace for yourself in those moments i think can also just be be really really helpful and powerful yeah yeah absolutely i think that's massive and and uh, yeah once you break that cycle and and you know if some people will be like oh i really need to get out the house you know they personally need mm-hmm. to get out of the house mm-hmm. and and as long as your dog is is comfortable being on their own at home or there's someone yeah. else at home go out for a walk without the dog yeah, absolutely that could, be, that could be so liberating for yeah. people that you know they've got a dog because they want to make themselves go for a walk and then they they yeah. can't um yeah. so you know go somewhere and, or, or even go somewhere where you couldn't go with your dog and, and, yeah. and you know enjoy that time yourself because if if the, the 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 better headspace you are in, the better able you are going to be to connect with your dog when when they are at home. And and I know some people also will have a have have um will say to me, oh, you know, uh, you know, if my dog doesn't get their walk at, at seven a.m. in the morning, like you know, all hell breaks loose. But you know, you you can set things up in a different way. The other the other thing to mention is is some of my clients do have dogs that um have been so worried at home that yeah. they haven't been able to toilet in the garden. Right. So obviously, if if your dog is is not comfortable enough to toilet in the garden, yeah, then the, obviously toilet trips somewhere yeah. that are suitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I do know clients that have been up at three, four a.m. because their yeah. dog was, you know, telling them they needed the toilet, and they're not able to go in the garden. So there are instances that sometimes yeah. you need to, to work through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nikki, this was lovely. Thank you so much for this conversation. I feel like. I think it's just a conversation that we need to have just so much more so often um because again as as more and more people you know bring dogs home I think I I see that transition right they start off with really uh strong conventional traditional advice and then they realize that it's just not in a lot of ways working for their dogs specifically and I think it just takes them so much time to arrive at that place where they can give themselves a little grace give their dogs a little grace and so i feel like if we were to have more conversations like these i think that people hopefully find them faster in their journey um and so thank you so much for for this this is just absolutely lovely thank you so much oh my absolute pleasure totally my tape uh, my favorite topic <laughs> and it, it's always an absolute joy talking to you thanks so much nikki take care bye